So it's a great honor and privilege to introduce uh, Dr. John Ogilai. Uh, Dr. Ogilai is the uh, professor, is a professor and also the chair of otolaryngology at the University of Southern California. Uh, also uh, president of ARO, is that right, John? Uh, you know, starting in another month, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the Association for Research of Otolaryngology, which is the largest otolaryngology research organization in the world. And so that's a big title for him and a big responsibility, but he's going to do a great job. Uh, he's going to give us a talk today on endolymphatic hydrops and sensory neural hearing loss from bench to bedside. So we're looking forward to his presentation. So John, thanks for taking the time out and, uh, and giving us some information. We appreciate it. Oh, it's really a pleasure, Bill. And it's just great to see everybody, even just virtually. I miss, I miss the communications with colleagues. <laughs> so this is wonderful. So, and I want to thank uh, Lauren Hussein for inviting me. Uh, that's really, really an honor. Um, okay, so let's see here. I, I think you can see my screen. If you can't, please let me know, but it looks like you should be seeing it. Uh, yeah, I have no good. disclosures. Okay, good. I have no disclosures for this talk. Uh, you know, most of the, this is kind of a, a talk that I've used before. So I think probably most of you know our department, um, but our, you know, our main, Hospital is Keck Hospital uh, here. And then we also work at Verdugo Hills Hospital. We're actually expanding um, there a little bit more. They, they want us to grow our surgical practice there and inpatient volume. And then, uh, of course, CHLA is for our, our PEDS um, training. Uh, and then LA County, it's kind of nice. It's just a couple blocks away from Keck, so it's really convenient for the residents. They're mostly at Keck and, and County. And then our main Keck clinic is right there on the, on the medical campus too. But then we have satellites in downtown LA, Beverly Hills. We moved to a new Glendale clinic um, about, well, it's almost been six months now. Um, and so we have better space there and a better audio booth and things like that. And it's on the, it's one of the medical office buildings next to Glendale Memorial Hospital. Uh, and then we have a La Cunata clinic um, the Caruso Family Center, which is uh, basically pediatric audiology, but also now we've been increasing our adult audiology and balance clinic is also on the Keck Medical Campus in another building. And then we have new satellites in Arcadia and Fullerton within the last year. And so this is our, our current uh, faculty and we're up to, I think 54, if I remember, I should count them. I think it's 54 at this point. So it's a pretty hefty group. The research division's gigantic. Not all of them are primary in our department. There's some of these people here are secondary faculty from other departments, but are strong collaborators. Um, one of the otologists that you may not know is Seiji Shibata. He's an MD PhD who trained at Iowa. And so he started here about six months ago. And he's following a clinician scientist pathway. This was in better times. <laughs> this was uh, our department end of the year picture from about a year and a half ago. And this includes all the clinic staff and, and uh, other things like that. I think it's about 160 people altogether or something like that. Okay, so just to get onto the meat of the talk. So, uh, you know, endolymphatic high drops, we don't know much about it, right? Probably um, the most common way we term patients with endolymphatic high drops is idiopathic. Um, we really don't have a clue what causes it, but we do know that some viral illnesses can, can be associated with it. Trauma, maybe bleeding into the labyrinth can perhaps cause endolymphatic high drops. Uh, otosclerosis or syphilitic change to the bone definitely kind of, uh, kind of constricts the, the vestibular aqueduct. Uh, autoimmune causes presumably can, can create an endolymphatic hydrops type picture. And maybe there's some genetic uh, link to it or, or certainly tumors like an endolymphatic site tumor could do it too. But, but by far, we, it's idiopathic. We really have no clue. And if, if you look at the, the criteria for Meniere's disease, so there's four categories. So the certain Meniere's disease means you have to have the temporal bone fixed and sliced and looked at it. You see distension of Reisner's membrane. 
And so, of course, that's not very practical. So in the clinic, we really look at either de definite Meniere's disease, meaning you've had two or more vertigo episodes, you've documented hearing loss on, a, on an audiogram, and they have some symptoms of tinnitus or oral fullness. Or probable Meniere's, meaning it's kind of, uh, they've only had one vertigo episode, but otherwise they have the symptoms of it. And then there's this huge category of possible Meniere's. You know, people are kind of dizzy or fluctuating hearing loss. We don't really know what's going on. Uh, but maybe it doesn't meet the full criteria of severe vertigo. So it's kind of a mess right now. It's a, it's a syndrome that we diagnose clinically. And then you throw onto this cochlear high drops, which is basically all of the auditory symptoms, but no vertigo whatsoever. And is that a different or the same as um, just kind of general endolymphatic high drops that causes Meniere's disease? So here's kind of what I tell patients. I'm not sure how accurate this is. And in fact, it's probably not very accurate. Um, this picture on the left comes from um, one of the academy handouts that you can give patients. And it basically describes the membranous labyrinth as these blue membranes in the cochlea and vestibular system, as well as to the endolymphatic sac. And they just become distended with endolymphatic high drops and or Meniere's disease. And this is a really old picture. And I, I'm sorry, I forget which journal it comes from. I should have put the reference here. But the thought being that if this is the normal membranous labyrinth, then when you have endolymphatic high drops, this becomes distended and might even touch the adjacent bony labyrinth, uh, labyrinthine wall. And if it gets too much pressure, then it's gonna pop and all the endolymph will fizzle out into the mix with the perilymph. And that's when you get the severe vertigo, um, you're throwing up and then maybe this heals with some kind of scar and then you're kind of back to kind of a more stable picture but maybe you lost some hair cells during that process and so this cycle of popping fizzing out and mixing of perilymph and lymph and then healing leads to this cycle of progressive degeneration and loss of hair cells and progressive sensory neural hearing loss so that's kind of what we you know how at least i described it to patients um we do have treatments that work, right? I mean, 90% of patients can be treated medically um, and, and with lifestyle changes. The problem is it's not really based on what that pathophysiology that I just kind of described. I mean, a low sodium diet seems to help a lot of people. Um, I'm not sure why. I mean, if it's a buildup of endolymph, you'd kind of think it'd be more potassium. Maybe we should be on a low potassium diet. Um, to me, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, elimination of caffeine, nicotine, and alcohol, you know, unclear exactly how that affects um, fluid, uh, the fluid compartments of the cochlea. Um, at least we don't know the pathophysiology of that. Uh, the reason I have this picture of my old chair, Bobby Alford, and his uh, old mentor, DeBakey, which both of which were actually trainees, uh, or were, uh, when I was a trainee, they were mentors of mine at Baylor is because when I trained under Dr. Alfer, he would admit these patients with acute high drops to the hospital for three days of bed rest. And this was his standard thing. And it, you know, I don't know why it worked. He said, reducing stress, put them in bed rest. Now, you know, nowadays, if you brought a patient into the hospital, made them lay there for three days, I think they'd be more stressed and, and that would not help, I suspect. Um, but that being said, I was always surprised how much it did actually help patients <laughs> to just kind of lay there. We put people on diuretics, again, presumably to help excrete fluid and excrete sodium. Um, I'm not, again, sure how that affects um, uh, uh, the endolymphatic compartment. Vestibular suppressants obviously are kind of helping the symptoms. Steroids, is there inflammation going on in the inner ear? We don't really know. Um, in acute high drops, if you do an MRI with gadolinium, it doesn't typically light up. Um, although I, I've heard some people say that sometimes they've seen the endolymphatic uh, sac and the vestibular aqueduct light up. Um, we used to use vasodilators. That was another big thing of Dr. Alford. He'd give the stellate ganglion blocks <laughs> um, to dilate um, uh, the blood vessels to the inner ear. And allergy therapy, again, we don't really know why it it can help, but, but sometimes it does. 
So we've got a, a disease, we don't really know what causes it. We've got a presumed pathophysiology that doesn't, in my opinion, really fit with any of the medical management that we, we use. So it's really a, a confusing disease. Uh, we have some you know, surgical or procedural type treatments. So you can do an endolymphatic sac decompression. You know, basically just take the bone off the sac. Maybe this gives it room to distend and reduces the pressure in the inner ear. Um, you know, when I do a vestibular uh, or an endolymphatic sac procedure, I've never seen that you take the bone off and all of a sudden this thing dilates out. <laughs> um, I'm assuming the amount of fluid in there is so small that, um, it, 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 you know, traditional fluid mechanics don't, <laughs> don't work. Certainly when I, I mean, if I'm there, I open it and I put in a shunt. I've never seen fluid gush out. <laughs> I'd love to know if any of you have seen that. Um, and then we can do destructive treatments to kind of, it doesn't stop whatever the high drops problem is, but at least the brain doesn't make you feel dizzy. And as far as I know, none of these are really designed to work to prevent the hearing loss that's associated with long-term um, Meniere's disease. They really only help treat the vertigo symptoms. So in my opinion, this, is a, this disease is a mess. And as physicians, it's very frustrating um, to all of us to treat a patient where we don't really know why they're sick and, and we're kind of doing empiric therapies. Um, so I, I want to, this introduction is to kind of bring you to um, this talk about some of our research into this area. And of course, this is the cochlea with the stapes, which vibrates with the sound um, input pressure and sets up a traveling wave that propagates up the, the cochlear duct and kind of peaks at the characteristic frequency um, that, it, uh, that that section of the basilar membrane is tuned to. And if you do a cross section, and this is the organ of Corti, um, you have the flu three um, fluid scala, the scala vestibuli, scala tympani, and um, uh, scala media with the endolymph. And of course, it's high perilymph, just like um, um, serum. Uh, it has, uh, perilymph has high sodium, just like serum. As, uh, and then the endolymph is high potassium. And the voltage in the paralymph is at zero millivolts, so ground, just like the rest of the body. But the uh, endolymph is a positive potential of plus 80 millivolts. Um, there are the, uh, two different types of hair cells, the inner hair cell, which is in one row, and then there are three rows of outer hair cells. And of course, the hair cells have a potential of around minus 60, minus 70 millivolts. So there's a big potential between the for the potassium in the endolymph to be pushed into the inside of a cell if you open up a transduction channel, because potassium is positive charge, so it's going to be repelled from the positive charge in the endolymph to enter the inside of the cell. And then, of course, there are the auditory nerves that come from the mostly from the inner hair cell to the brain and carry the sound. And there are some um, afferent nerves from outer hair cells, but mostly the nerves to the outer hair cells are efferent and kind of control how they amplify the vibrations. Okay, so just to, after reviewing that anatomy, a little bit of physiology about the potassium recycling process. So, so the spiral ligament is this lighter blue area right on the outside of the cochlear duct. But then this, this kind of purple area or dark blue area is the the stria vascularis. So it, it has a lot of capillaries and these cells function to secrete potassium into the endolymph. And then that potassium sits there, it's taken up by the hair cells during sound transduction. And then it's passed through gap junctions back through the supporting cells back to the, to the stria. And so this is where like a connection 26 mutation that causes hearing loss, that's a gap junction protein in these cells that if it's mutated, you don't get this recycling of potassium. And so that's why you get hearing loss. But there's this normal constant flow of potassium in a healthy cochlea. And so as the basilar membrane is moving up and moving down, the stereocilia of the hair cells are moving back and forth. And so when they're you know, pushed to the side, then it blocks the transduction channels and potassium can't enter the hair cell. And when the basilar membrane moves up, 
the transduction channels open and more potassium can enter. And so on a cycle by cycle basis with the sound as this is, you know, basal membranes going up and down, the bundles are moving back and forth. The amount of potassium in the hair cells is changing cycle by cycle, meaning the voltage in the cell is changing. And that leads to synaptic transmission to the auditory nerve. Okay, so how does hearing loss happen? So there's, there, uh, it, we really look at uh, noise trauma as a good model uh, for hearing loss. And if you, if you look at this, I mean, one of the common things is hair cell loss. So this is a mouse cochlea and we stained outer hair cells red. And so you can kind of see, like in this area, you can kind of see three rows of, of outer hair cells. And then inner hair cells are green. And so at the apex or low frequency region of the cochlea, there's an going all the way down the spiral. There's pretty much all hair cells are there until you get near the base. And then you start to see a lot of missing red cells. And so there's loss of outer hair cells. So typical noise exposure, uh, in this case, we did noise at, uh, I don't know, four to 22 kilohertz. And in a mouse, let's see here. In a mouse, those frequencies are tuned to this region of the cochlea. It's a much higher hearing, higher frequency hearing animal than a human. So we're playing noise where the traveling wave kind of peaks in the base, uh, sorry, in the apex of the cochlea. But interestingly, all the hair cell loss is in the, is in the base. So noise causes high frequency hearing loss, even though it might not be high frequency noise that you're listening to. So you lose your hair cells, so you get hearing loss. Now, the other thing that noise does is it damages the synapse between the hair, inner hair cell and the auditory nerve. So you get damage to the auditory nerve, and it, that's called cochlear synaptopathy. And these are old studies, but you can see here, here's an inner hair cell. There's its nucleus, and here's the inner hair cell stereociliary bundle. And at the bottom, the nerves would come here, and they're little black um, terminals, which are dendritic terminals. And each inner hair cell has about eight to 10, uh, roughly. Um, sometimes it can get up to 15 uh, terminals. Now, after noise, you see how they're all swollen here. So these are damaged dendritic terminals. They're swollen and irritated. Um, and you can replicate that by um, just applying glutamate, which is the neurotransmitter that inner hair cells secrete. If you just apply glutamate, even without noise, you get these large. Um, dendritic swelling, area, and that's damage. And eventually these will, will die and pull back. So, and in fact, here's kind of a schematic diagram of cochlear synaptopathy where you've got a, an inner hair cell, you've got auditory nerves with a synaptic uh, connection here. And inside the inner hair cell, there's a little area called this ribbon synapse or synaptic ribbon. That's where all the vesicles sit. And so the synaptic vesicles sit there and then they would secrete, they'd kind of bind with the plasma membrane and secrete the glutamate. And then there's the dendritic terminal on the other side. And after noise, you lose both the synaptic ribbons and the, there's retraction of the, the, the dendritic terminals of the auditory nerve. So with noise, you get both hair cell loss. And even if you don't lose the hair cell, you might be losing some of the nerves that go, that innervate the hair cell. So we studied, um, we got a grant uh, from the Department of Defense to study blast-induced hearing loss. And this was a while ago. This was when the, the Middle East wars were going on. And it's a major, blast-induced hearing loss is a major cause of morbidity um, uh, for US military personnel. And in fact, that was the most common reason a soldier couldn't go back into battle was because they had hearing loss and mostly from roadside bombs. Scientifically, it's a nice thing to study because it, uh, it's really kind of an extreme form of a noise-induced hearing loss, rather than playing like two hours of noise or four hours of noise. And it happens all at one time immediately, and then we can immediately start studying what happens to the cochlea afterwards. So it's easy to understand the sequence of damage that happens. When you're doing a few hours of noise, you know, damage is happening during the noise exposure process that we can't be studying. So we built a mouse blast chamber. And um, so these are two trainees in the lab. 
Uh, and this is on the roof of our research building. This is back when I was at Stanford. Um, and we put it out there and we could do the blasts. And so this is a pressurized chamber that we hooked up to an air compressor. So we could fill it up with pressurized air. And then we had a valve that we would release and that pressurized air would travel down this long barrel, just like the rifle on a gun. And then around near the end, there would be an anesthetized mouse. And he's, so he doesn't feel anything. He's hanging there. He's in a, his body is shielded and only his ears stick out. So only his ears get the, the blast pressure, but the rest of the body's fine. And, and then when he wakes, he doesn't have any pain. He just, you know, has hearing loss. And so the reason we have such a long barrel is the pressure wave actually uh, increases in magnitude the longer the barrel. Um, it's shorter in duration, but it, it sharpens to a much higher peak, kind of like the difference between a pistol and a rifle. And so when you put a mouse in the blast chamber and then look at them three months after the blast, this is a control mouse. So in a control mouse, red is outer hair cells. You see all the outer and, and green is inner hair cells. You see all the inner hair cells. In a, in a mouse that's been blast exposed, the inner hair cells are mostly there, but you lose basically every outer hair cell in the high frequency region of the mouse cochlea. So the basal outer hair cell. So it, kills off all the high frequency hair, uh, outer hair cells. Now we thought there might be severe trauma to the cochlea, you know, the risers membrane would be all torn, pectoral membrane would be flopping, basilar membrane might be shattered. When we did histology, this is just um, a week after the blast, but, but it's the same three months afterwards. We actually saw no difference between the anatomy of control mice and, and blasted mice. The only difference is there were loss of outer hair cells in the base, but otherwise we saw no, no significant difference. Um, okay, so at this point, this is where our grant came in. And so, you know, with research, it's always you're taking a crapshoot whether what you do is gonna work or not. So you can do the Homer Simpson thing and, you know, you can be kind of scared when things don't work. Uh, we usually follow the Peter Pan principle. <laughs> so most things don't work, but every once in a while, something good does work out. And so we, you know, those are the ones you live for. And so uh, I started collaborating with a bioengineer who uses optical coherence tomography. And this is a, a technique, it's kind of like an ultrasound, but instead of using ultrasonic waves, it uses uh, laser light. And uh, it goes into the tissue some of the light gets absorbed, some gets scattered, but some gets reflected back up into the microscope. And it can, you can take that light that comes back and compare it to the light you sent in, and that lets you get an image or a depth profile of what it looks like. And if you scan that laser over the tissue, you can get a 3D volumetric image. So it's like ultrasound. It doesn't go in as deep because the wavelength of light is much shorter than the wavelength of, of ultrasonic waves, but it gives you much better resolution. And so every ophthalmologist, uh, pretty much has an OCT set up in their um, clinic right now, and they image into the eye, and they can see the different layers of the retina. So we, we started using it in the mouse cochlea. And I don't need to go through this part. It's basically what I just described. But, but this is the setup we built. So, so this is the optics of the OCT. It's a lot of different kind of fibers. And as long as you know what fibers to buy, you can just screw them together and it just works. And then we have a dissecting microscope here. And this yellow fiber carries the laser light in. And there's a scan mirror here that scans over the, the surface of the cochlea. And then the mouse is sitting on this table and it, there's a heating pad, he's anesthetized. And we open the, the, the middle ear bull or mastoid. And you can see the outside of the otic capsule bone, and we just beam the laser in and it goes right through the bone and lets us see inside the mouse cochlea. So this is a, a volumetric image of a live mouse cochlea. And I think you can see maybe the three scala of the, of the, the cochlea. And you know, it didn't take long to collect the image. It's actually taking much longer to kind of show this little movie of it. We can get a volumetric image um, really fast. Now we're, I think we're up to like five frames per second. So five of these volumes per second. You can see the cochlear spiral there. So you see the three fluid chambers here. 
And Brian Applegate is the bioengineer that I worked with. Patrick Raphael was a programmer in our lab. And so this has been a long-term project, well over 10 years now. Uh, little by little, we've gotten better at it. Um, Jink Young is a postdoc that came from Korea to work in our lab. And, and so she used OCT to study what happens to the mouse cochlea after blast injury. And she studied the apical region, the apical turn of the mouse cochlea, kind of this section here. So you can see the three scala, and here's the OCT image of the three scala. So this is the endolymphatic compartment here. You can see Reisner's membrane. Uh, basilar membrane would be here. This is tectoral membrane. You don't see individual hair cells, but this is where the hair cells would be. And this darker space is the tunnel of corti. That's the space between the inner hair cells and the outer hair cells. And then the auditory nerves would come in and, and you know, the cell bodies would be over here. So hopefully that's, that's clear. And so the nice thing is we can do this non-invasively and, and, and assess how the cochlea is working and as well as get nice images. So what she found is she, so she blasted a mouse on the roof of the building, kept the mouse anesthetized, brought him down to the lab on the first floor, uh, opened up the middle ear bulla and then took an image. And that process was about one hour after the blast was finished. And you, she could see Reisner's membrane looked a little bit maybe distended here. And she just kept doing images. Here's two hours, it was more distended. And by three hours, it was much more distended. So the mouse got post blast uh, endolymphatic hydrops. And then she had some other mice that she blasted but didn't go do the surgery right away. She just kind of let them wake up and then looked at them one day, two days, and seven days later. And they all had normal Reisner's membrane position. So it was a temporary endolymphatic high drops after the blast exposure. Uh, in a control mouse, if you just take a mouse, don't blast them, but just do the surgery and image them, then Reisner's membrane stays in this, the normal position. And interestingly, if you take a mouse, you sacrifice it, and just image it one, two, and three hours after death, Reisner's membrane goes the opposite direction. It sinks in, which kind of makes sense. I guess if the if there's no blood flow, then the capillaries and stravascularis can't, you know, there's no, there's no energy to secrete potassium. So there's less potassium, less endolymph that's being produced. And so, and that's why it would sink in. So this is a way to image endolymphatic hydrops or, or scale and media volume in live. So this is just time-lapse imaging. So this is a control blasted mouse and a dead mouse. And she just took like really fast images. And I think you can see the Reisner's membrane here. And with time, it just kind of started ballooning out, whereas the dead kind of went the other way. Now, um, let me just show that one more time. Then our next question was, well, you know, we know the pathophysiology that we tell patients that it gets big, it gets big, and then all of a sudden it pops and it fizzles down. So we wanted to see, is that true? Does this pop? And if so, then we kind of expected this Reisner's membrane would suddenly kind of flatten out as all the tension was released. And so we, we blasted a mouse and then started imaging from hours eight to 10 after the blast. In fact, what we found is it didn't do that. It just kind of slowly started to come back down after a period of time. And so it didn't seem like what we're telling patients at least with idiopathic endolymphatic high drops makes sense with blast induced or noise induced endolymphatic high drops. Uh, we quantified the volume of endolymph after the blast. And it basically, this that's what this just shows. Is in a control mouse, there's really no change in endolymphatic volume. In a blasted mouse, it goes up almost, almost doubling, but then by one day afterwards, it goes back down to normal and post-mortem, it just drops. So we looked at hair cells in this mouse. Uh, the blast we used to create endolymphatic high drops wasn't as severe as the one where we killed all that, the outer hair cells in the base. So this was, we use a, a less powerful blast. And in this case, we lost a, about half of the hair cells in the base, as you can see here. An occasional hair cell was lost in the middle, but not much. And in the apex, there was no outer hair cell loss. 
So we looked at uh, uh, using scanning electron microscopy and Nicholas Grier was a colleague of mine uh, who does this. And, and so he imaged a control mouse and you can see the outer hair cell bundles, nice V-shaped three rows of stereocilia here. But after blast, immediately we sacrificed the mouse, collected and did the imaging. You can see the, the bundles are all damaged. So it makes sense. I mean, this is the most sensitive uh, mechanotransducer in the body and certainly within the cochlea. And so the blast is such a powerful injury, you kind of, it makes sense that it would damage this delicate apparatus. So just to prove that the bundle damage was, was what led to the initiation of hair cell damage, we took a mutant mouse. And this is a mouse that has a tectoral membrane mutation such that the, it's lifted up in the air. So it's not touching and not attached to the bundles of the outer hair cells. So and here's an image of it. So this mouse has a, a roughly 60 decibel um, sensory neural hearing loss because there's no um, function of the outer hair cells and they, they don't have autoacoustic emissions. And in this mouse, if you expose them to a loud blast, there's no hair cell damage, which again proves that basically if you're not damaging the bundles, then you don't lose the hair cell. So that's a kind of a nice way to, to prove that the blast injury is really happening through bundle damage and then causing hair cell loss, not through major membranous rupture of the intralabyrinthine structures. Well, then we went and looked at the auditory nerves that we assessed for cochlear synaptopathy. Now in this study, we actually just, uh, you see, if you see these, these uh, green circles are the inner hair cell nuclei. Um, these little teeny green dots are the synaptic ribbons which synapse with the auditory nerves at the base of the inner hair cells. There are also some green dots under the outer hair cells. There's a lot less of them because it's just less auditory nerves for outer hair cells compared to inner. So in control, you see there's a lot of green dots. Seven days after the blast, there's less green dots. So it means you lose synapses, meaning that you get cochlear synaptopathy. And when we quantified this, it was throughout the cochlea and you lost about half of the synapses. And it was for both the inner hair cells and for the outer hair cells. So in this blast exposure model, we had both hair cell loss, but it was mostly at the base. Whereas we had cochlear synaptopathy that occurred pretty much equally throughout the cochlea. And so these are different path patterns of, of damage. And it suggests that the way the trauma is happening is different. And so we wanted to understand, well, why is co cochlear synaptopathy happening equally throughout the cochlea? And our hypothesis is that, well, maybe it's the endolymphatic hydrops that's affecting uh, things and causing the, um, the, the loss of uh, uh, hair cell inner, uh, auditory nerve synapses. It kind of fits with some older data if, that came out of uh, the temporal bone histopathology lab at Mass Eye and Ear where they looked at um, spiral ganglion cell counts in patients with Meniere's disease. And they compared it to the hair cell counts. And in fact, it turns out patients with Meniere's disease maintain more hair cells um, relative to the number of spiral ganglion cells than with other types of hearing loss. So it kind of fits with that, that maybe, maybe endolymphatic high drops damages auditory nerves more than hair cells. So one experiment we did is, well, we wanted to see, is there mixing of perilymph and endolymph? So this is an, a diagram of an unrolled, uh, a kind of a, a rolled, unrolled uh, mouse cochlea. Stapes, round window membrane, the perilymph connected at the helicotrema, and then the endolymphatic compartment. So we took out the stapes. We put a pipette in through the round window filled with gold nanoparticles, and we perfused the perilymph. And then we imaged it with OCT, thinking that if there's some holes in the membranous labyrinth, then we should see gold nanoparticles enter the endolymph. And so here's a control mouse. You can see the three fluid chambers. So this is the endolymph right here. And you're gonna quickly see that this is gonna fill with gold nanoparticles and then this endolymph will not. So you see it's black. Now we put in the gold nanoparticles and the endolymph 
stays black. So in a control mouse, there's no mixing of endolymph and perilymph. Now, if you look at a mouse three hours after the blast, they have endolymphatic high drops. And we did the study, we perfused, there it goes. And at least within the time frame of this experiment, there was also no mixing of perilymph and endolymph. So it kind of fits with what we had thought before is that the membranous labyrinth stays intact. Even, uh, and so the reason you get endolymphatic high drops has nothing to do with any kind of ruptures in the um, barrier between endolymph and perilymph. So, so another hypothesis is here, it's kind of shown in schematically here. So if you have a normal mouse um, and you expose them to a blast, you damage the stereocellular bundles as we showed from the electron microscopy. Well, maybe potassium gets secreted by the stria, but it can't get taken up by the hair cells because the, the transduction channels are damaged. And so you don't get this recycling anymore. And so the pathway is blocked here. You keep secreting potassium, it increases. That's gonna increase the osmolarity of the endolymph and maybe it draws in water. And there are aquaporin channels actually throughout the cochlea where water can flow. And so to test this hypothesis, we applied furosemide before the blast. And we thought, well, if we use furosemide which blocks potassium secretion from the stria. This is why it can cause a, a temporary sensory no hearing loss. As well as blocked it here, well then it, you shouldn't get a buildup of potassium. And in fact, that's exactly what we found. So in the blast exposed mouse, there was no increase, no distension of Reister's membrane, and there was no increase in the endolymph volume compared to control. So, so it looks like blocking potassium secretion from the stria kind of counteracted the, maybe the damage from the bundle. Hopefully that makes sense. Well, what we then thought is if it's, if it's that simple, if it's just the osmotic gradient between the endolymph and the perilymph that's causing high drops, then we don't even need to do a blast. We should just be able to change the osmolarity of the perilymph. And that should, we should be able to control the position of Reister's membrane. So if you have a hypotonic solution in the perilymph, then more water will want to go into the endolymph and you should get distension in endolymphatic high drops and vice versa. Hypertonic solution should make it sink in. And so we did this experiment and we perfused the perilymph like that. And so 304 is normal, uh, is a normal tonic solution. And so we perfused the perilymph here and you can see Reisner's membrane stayed flat. A little bit hypotonic, immediately within just a minute or two, you get huge endolymphatic high drops. Hypertonic, it kind of sinks in and you get less endolymph. So it's really an, the osmotic gradient that's the key diff cause of, of, of the amount of volume of endolymph that you have. Which is kind of neat because now that can give us a way to potentially you know, treat a, a noise or a blast exposed animal. So <clears throat> here's a blast exposed animal three hours afterwards and there's some endolymphatic high drops. We applied normal tonic perilymph and we did this through the um, eardrum. And so it was applied to the round window. So it, it, it needed to diffuse in and there was no change. Instead, if we applied a really hyper osmotic um, saline, um, we could actually treat the blast induced endolymphatic high drops. And that's just quantified here. And so this is a treatment for post-blast endolymphatic high drops. Now the question is, well, does that, does that help anything? Does it prevent the hearing loss after the blast trauma? So this is just a bunch of anesthetized mice. We, we blasted a whole bunch of them, blasted them. It, it, the blast causes a hole in the eardrum. And so we can just pipette in different solutions into their ears. And so it was a randomized trial. And we some of them got normal tonic, saline, some of them got hypertonic saline, and then we waited to see what happens. And to make a long story short, what we found is um, uh, if you applied a hypertonic treatment, we were able to preserve most of the synapses under the hair cells. 
in uh, both out, outer hair cells and inner hair cells. But it didn't prevent hair, uh, hair cell loss. So the hair cell loss, presumably due to stereocellular damage, really can't, it has nothing to do with the endolymphatic hide belt. It presumably happens immediately. Um, whereas the, the synaptopathy can be treated by preventing the endolymphatic hydrolysis. And this was two months after the blast. Now, since I moved here, we've gotten better at doing these imaging studies. And so now you can really see, this is Jumei, a technician, and Yuki, a postdoc. You can see all of these dots right here. These are all the synaptic ribbons. And Ido is a medical student when he did this. Now he's a resident in our program. Um, and you can see after just the noise exposure, there's a lot of uh, reduction in the synapses here too. And so Ida wanted to assess, well, how much noise does it take to get endolymphatic high drops after noise? And, and it, does this correlate with synaptic ribbon loss? And so he exposed cohorts of mice to either 80 dB noise, 90 dB, 95, 100, and he measured the endolymphatic volume. And in fact, with 80, 90, and 95, there was no endolymphatic high drops after the noise. But with 100 dB SPL, there was endolymphatic high drops. And when he did synaptic ribbon counts, it was only the 100 dB noise where there was reductions in synapses. So it does correlate that you get loss of auditory neurons and, audit and synapses in the inner hair cells with um, endolymphatic high drops. So they work together. Now, we don't know whether the endolymphatic high drops causes the, the synaptic ribbon loss or the cochlear synaptopathy, or if they're just two things that are caused by the same condition. And that's what we're studying now in the lab. Oh, that's what it says here. Is it correlative or causative? But what's kind of neat is <clears throat> this imaging technique does give us a way to predict if you're going to have loss of neurons. And potentially, we could even treat patients. Um, I imagine uh, I'm not alone in this group of getting calls, usually on July 5th, from pediatricians or um, other otolaryngologists who get a patient who was a kid playing with firecrackers the night before, and it went off right next to their ear, and then the next morning they're having trouble hearing out of the ear and it feels stuffy. And I'm imagining that's a, a post-noise exposure and lymphatic high drops. And at this point, I mean, I just tell them to use steroids because that's kind of all we know. But presumably that's going to lead to, to some type of um, synaptopathy as well. And so I don't know, maybe this is a, a treatment for this. Should we be giving diuretics after noise exposure? Um, our study doesn't say one way or the other for sure, but it's something to consider. And it's, it kind of informs our future studies. But just to bring this back to a more of a clinical level. Um, this is, a, I don't know if you guys do this or not. I very rarely will do a glycerol test <laughs> for endolymphatic high drops. It's a really old technique, but it's kind of based on some of this stuff that I just talked about here. And you get a hearing test. You have the patient, you presumably have a low frequency sensory null hearing loss with that. You have the patient drink glycerol, which is a, a highly osmotic agent. And then you repeat the hearing test maybe two to four hours after after that. And if the thresholds improve, well, then that means they had endolymphatic high drops. Uh, you know, it's not really all that sensitive. It, I think it's probably reasonably specific because how can you improve a sensory neural hearing loss if not for something like that? But um, when do I use it? It's if I have a really questionable diagnosis <clears throat> or if it's like a pediatric patient that kind of has a classic history for uh, endolymphatic high drops, but I, I'm kind of leery to start a diuretic on a kid, well, then I would do this kind of test. And if it's positive, then I'd get their pediatrician involved to help, help with that. I don't know, I just use it in tough situations. and I don't know how, to, <clears throat> how valuable it is, but, but I did want to present one interesting patient, maybe six months ago that I cared for, where it kind of came in, 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 in handy. And so this patient was a movie star here in LA. And he had, um, he was doing some kind of a stunt. He rolled backwards and hit his head. It doesn't sound like it was a hard hit, but um, 
He felt okay afterwards, but the next morning he woke up, he couldn't hear out of his right ear. And this was his audiogram a couple days afterwards. And he had good word recognition scores. <clears throat> he had no vertigo at all. He just had the hearing loss. And his ENT started him on oral steroids and it came all back and everybody was, you know, he was happy, the doctor was happy. But then what happened is after the steroids kind of tapered, it went back to the way it was. And he went on multiple courses of steroids, you know, went around and saw a bunch of different doctors. They had some injections of steroids and it would kind of come up part way, but then it would always go back down. And then sometimes steroids didn't help anymore. Um, <clears throat> he came to see me about three months after that, that trauma. And this was his right hearing at that time. So it, was, it had gotten actually even worse. So I thought it was some kind of post-traumatic endolymphatic high drops. Um, I wasn't 100% sure. I gave him a glycerol test. And this is where his thresholds came up later that day. So to me, that was pretty convincing that uh, this is a treatable form of sensory neural hearing loss and that you know, we should try working with it. We also got one of these um, special delayed gadolinium um, MRIs, which I really had never done before, but I have to say I kind of sold me on it for certain difficult situations. So this is his, um, uh, the MRIs, you know, you get, it, you get an MRI with or without, and then you get another MRI, like I think it's three to four hours later. And by that time, the gadolinium has had time to partition into the perilymph, but it doesn't partition into the endolymph. And so you can see the lateral semicircular canals on both sides, and the black is the membranous labyrinth. And so you can kind of see that at least his vestibular system appears to have similar amounts of endolymph on both sides. But on here's his cochlea, and you can see that there's distension of scala media in the right side, but not on the left which this is the first time I've seen one of these images that actually convinced me this technique works. And it was only in the side where he had the symptoms and the positive glycerol test. So I was pretty, I was pretty happy that we could see that. So we diagnosed it with right cochlear high drops. <clears throat> now you're probably wondering where this is going here. So, uh, you know, we did the standard thing, low salt diet, diuretics, lifestyle changes. Uh, the whole thing, we did more oral, more IT. Yeah, maybe it kind of helped a little, but nothing too much. I actually got rheumatology involved thinking, well, maybe there's some inflammatory component after the trauma. So we put them on azathioprine and, you know, four weeks isn't very long. But the problem is um, <clears throat> he needed to restart filming. And COVID was starting to pick up. And he couldn't do his filming here in LA like they had been. And so this, the company said, look, we're gonna to move to New Zealand. You gotta, you know, and so he knew he's moving to New Zealand and it's gonna be for a year. So we couldn't keep messing around. And New Zealand, of course, they don't have COVID there, right? I mean, everybody comes in, you're being quarantined for two weeks in, a, <laughs> in your hotel room before they let you out. And so um, we had to start, you know, doing something. And so, you know, I did an endolymphatic shunt. We talked a lot about it. I've never used it just for auditory symptoms. I've only used it to kind of treat the vestibular symptoms. But I thought, well, it's kind of a special, it's different than idiopathic. I mean, we know it started after a trauma. So I did a shunt. This is just an intraoperative. You can see the um, mastoid antrum here, the facial nerve is in this area, and you can see where we kind of opened up the sac here. And it didn't show up as, these things never show up as good on the pictures as I wanted. But if you can see the outer leaflet of the sac is lifted up. I mean, all I did was make a slit and it actually ballooned up and there was this yellow goo that came out. And I was shocked. I've never seen anything come out when I've opened up a sac. But this one had yellow goo and I, I slurped it out. It was looked like mucus. And then we put in a, uh, a silastic stent. And I was shocked, but son of a gun, I mean, his hearing came right back. And this was, we had four and seven weeks and then he moved to New Zealand. And we're still kind of tracking him from New Zealand with one of these iPad based audiometers and it seems to be fairly stable. Um, so I don't know, I don't, I can't say much about what happened. Maybe there was some degraded blood products. 
um, that were kind of built up and whatever it needed to get out. It, it seemed like it helped. <laughs> It's not all that scientific. I wish I could be more scientific about it. One of the things we wanna do is we're turning this technology into a human uh, OCT scope. Um, in the mouse, we just look right through the otocapsule bone to see into the cochlea. We can see the whole cochlea, it's great. In the human, the otocapsule bone's a little thicker. It's harder to see through. You can a little, but not as good. So one of the things we're doing is we're building an endoscope where the light comes out at a 90 degrees and lets us look through the round window. And we should get an image like this. In the gerbil, it works really well. And so you can see um, the round window membrane here. This is the basilar membrane. This is Reisner's membrane. If this patient had cochlear high drops, you would, or if the skinny pig did, you would, or gerbil, you'd see the distended. And we've been doing it on human cadavers as well. It's, I mean, it's bigger. So the round, uh, round window membranes here, Basilar membranes here and Reisner's membranes really sunken in because it was a frozen temple bone. And we've started doing this in the operating room um, on our patients and we have an ongoing clinical trial. I can't say we've gotten great data yet. It's a little tricky to get all the software and everything working fast on a, because uh, you kind of have to hold it with your hand. It isn't like I've got a microscope mounted to a floating air table. <laughs> and so holding it steady and getting an image fast enough is very tricky. So right now it's actually a software thing more than a hardware thing. Uh, we also have kind of a nice one, which is in, it's in an otoscope fashion. So you just put an ear tip on and you can look through the ear. And this is the video. And hopefully you can see, I think here's the, yeah, that's the malleus right there. And it's kind of doing a line scan. And you can see the, the eardrum here in real time. And you can see that uh, that's the umbo right there in the malleus. And you can actually see into the middle ear. You can see the ossicles. You can definitely see the promontory. And you can see into it a little bit. And I think we can measure blood flow in the stria. So that's kind of where we're looking with this. And whether or not we'll be able to look through the otocapsule bone, in fact, here is the otocapsule bone right here, into the, and see Reisner's membrane is a, I'm not sure. It'd be great if we could, but maybe, maybe someday. So uh, yeah, thank you for your attention. Um, this is our lab group outside the research building. There was a, this was you know, before COVID, but there was a, a smart alarm, smoke alarm went off. And so everybody from the whole building had to go outside and here we were kind of conglomerated in better, better days. So thank you very much. Hello, my name is Dr. Kevin Peng, neurotologist here at the House Institute. Thank you for watching this video. The House Institute provides free educational videos for hearing health professionals worldwide. To help support videos like these and other educational efforts, please consider donating by clicking the link in the description box below. Your generous support allows us to keep videos like these at no cost for you and others. Thank you.